Hello, and welcome to Test All the Things with Intern. During this hour-long workshop, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to introduce you to the Intern testing tool, describe some of its capabilities, and show you how to use it to test a simple React application in a couple different ways. This workshop doesn't assume that you have much experience writing tests, or really any experience, uh, but you should be familiar with JavaScript or TypeScript. If you'd like to follow along, uh, open a terminal and make sure that you have at least Node and NPM in your path. Uh, you'll also need Java installed if you want to run some of the tests that we write later. Uh, the tests aren't actually written in Java, but one of the tools used by intern Selenium is written in Java, so you need that to actually run those. So first off, a little bit about myself and what I do. Uh, I am a software engineer at SitePen. Uh, at SitePen, we are the co-creators and maintainers of the Dojo Toolkit, and uh, we're also the developers of the new modern Dojo framework, along with several other open source projects, including Intern. Uh, we also run the first TypeScript-focused conference, TSConf, which is uh, on its third year this year. I am also the lead maintainer of Intern, so you know I try to keep things up to date, keep uh, you know manage releases. Uh, if you have feature requests or bugs, those will likely eventually land with me, so it keeps me busy. And then in my spare time, uh, I really like to work with home automation. Like I have uh, basically, I have a couple of home automation hubs that I've set up, and I wire up like all the lights in my house and electrical you know, switches. Uh, I have a variety of sensors for like temperature and humidity and pressure and all that uh, just sort of scattered around and you know I come up with interesting ways to use that so like on a good day I don't have to touch any light switches in the house. It's it's a learning process though so you know that doesn't always work but uh, but it's really awesome when it does it's it's neat to see code uh, you know working with the physical world. So what are we going to do today? Uh, the goal here is to give an overview of Intern and kind of show you some of the things you can do with Intern. So we're going to you know, set it up, write several kinds of tests, but it's only an hour so we can't go into a lot of depth. So I'm mostly just going to be giving quick flybys of how to write uh, a few different kinds of tests and um, you know, again, just show you some of the things that you can do. So first off, let's get into uh, what actually is intern. So obviously it's a testing tool. It was originally created for the Dojo Toolkit uh, several years ago when Dojo was making its switch to AMD uh, and heavier use of asynchronous code, uh, things like promises. Uh, when you know back in the early days there and so uh, the you know one of the site pen engineers then created intern to be uh, a more effective way to test that kind of code probably interns key differentiator right now is that it supports the full testing life cycle so with intern out of the box you can write unit tests you can write function te functional tests uh, and full stack integration tests and we'll go into the difference in those a little bit more in a couple of slides. Uh, another differentiator is that Intern really focuses on testing in real browsers. So it can use, I mean, it can run tests in Node, and that's what it does by default, but it also tries to make it easy to run your tests in browsers. Uh, Intern can also collect code coverage. So, uh, you know, to help you know how well your unit tests are exercising uh, your, your application code. And it's, it's extensible. It's pretty easy to write plugins for. And there are a couple of existing plugins that we'll look at later on uh, today. And it's pretty easy to plug in, turn into CI systems as well. So when we talk about unit tests and functional tests, uh, well, unit tests are the ones that probably most people who write tests are familiar with. Those are tests that load uh, application code and just call functions in it directly, you know, instantiate classes, work with them, and look at the output, again, just directly from the code. 
and we like to say those, uh, those test code from the developer's perspective. The other major kind of test uh, is functional tests. Functional tests actually sort of sit outside the application. They don't load application code directly. They don't, they don't see it or touch it. Instead, uh, functional tests act a lot like a user and they, they exercise you know, sort of the user level functionality of an application. So a functional test might uh, tell a browser to load uh, an application page, like you know, to load some web page. Then it might look on the page and find certain elements. Uh, it might find a button and tell the browser to click that button and then look at some output or you know, some text in a field to see if it changed. So functional test, test code from a user's perspective instead of from a developer's perspective. So when we talk about how we organize tests in intern, we, we have three sort of broad uh, terms there. At the top level are suites. These are groups of tests that are, you know, it's a logical grouping. So very frequently a suite is, uh, is created for a particular module, let's say. So, um, you know, you're testing the button module in your application so you would make a button suite and then put all the tests for button in there uh, but you, you know you don't have to have just one suite per file there can be multiple um, and you can nest suites so if you want to have finer grain groupings uh, you can you can do that tests are the things that actually exercise code or maybe exercise the browser uh, and make assertions so I mean, the test is, is the thing that's actually doing the work. And then uh, tests can be asynchronous, so they can work with async code. Uh, you just return a promise and in turn, that's, that's the basic async unit. And within test, uh, the checks you're actually making are called assertions. So when you do something like, you know, you, you, you call a function and look at its output, you're going to make an assertion about its output and you're going to check and see that something uh, is true. Maybe, maybe you call a function that's supposed to append something to an array, you get back the array and you would assert that the length of the array was one bigger than it started out. Uh, Intern provides the Chai library, which is a popular third-party assertion library, and it gives you a lot of these high-level assertions like asserting that the length of something is something you expect, or asserting that a value is true or is null, or things like that. Um, you can also just write your own assertions. Basically anything, you know, the only thing an assertion has to do is throw an exception if there's a problem. So if you, if you check a condition and it's bad, you would throw an exception. Otherwise, you know, you don't. Uh, and when you use something like Chai, it's just, uh, it's making that process a little cleaner and easier to read. So we provide that, uh, but Intern is very flexible about actually what you use there. So let's kind of get started on this and jump right in here and take a look at what our test application is. And you can see this down here, we're going to be getting something from this intern tutorial repository. So first off, let's just clone that. We'll go in there and we're checking out the OpenJS world tutorial branch. So we have that and then we're just going to install our app. Uh, it's a standard you know, node application created with create react app. Well, I guess it's a react application. Uh, so we can just run npm install. It should also work with yarn. I just use npm all the time. So once that installs, we will be able to run npm start and that will start up the application uh, in, a, in a development server and open it up in a browser here. And then we'll be able to take a look at it and you know see what it does as soon as this finishes installing. It's not npm is never the fastest thing. Okay. And we're good. So we've cloned our repo, installed our thing, we're running start. And so here we go, our application in all of its glory is a calculator. 
it's, you know, a standard, simple, little multifunction calculator. 7 plus 3 equals 10. Hopefully. It's good. It's not a thoroughly tested calculator, which, you know, is fine for our purposes. Um, but it, it makes a nice, it, it's nice and interactive and has easily extractable logic. So let's take a little closer look at what's in our flashy calculator here real quick, just because it makes testing a little bit easier. Um, okay, so in here we have, uh, you know, the standard React layout. We have a public directory with our static assets. We have a source directory that has all of our code in it. And in our code here, uh, we have components and just a couple other things. We don't have any further breakdown in our code because this is a very simple application. We don't need a components directory and a, you know, etc. So we have our capitalized components here. We have two other modules. We have common, which is just some TypeScript types, and I think one constant. And then we have this logic module here, which is where the, the logic that actually, you know, handles things like plus and minus and equals lives. So let's take a quick look at our code. So if we look at our calculator code here, uh, it is a React component. It's a functional component. So we just we're exporting a function that is our component. Within that, we're using some React hooks here uh, to create some state variables and some things to update them. So we have this you know value total in operation. Uh, we have this button args thing that we've made down here, and that is just all of these uh, these six variables up here. We're just sticking them in an object. We will use these uh, with the logic that actually manages our buttons. This button handlers thing is just uh, binding the names of keys on the keyboard to particular button handlers so that we can also use the keyboard to do things as well as click buttons. The button handlers themselves come from this button handlers constant and there's just one per button, so AC goes with the AC button, divide goes with divide, times goes with times, etc. We can see down here we have a couple of you know event handlers. Um, we bind the, the keyboard handler to the entire window, which is not maybe what you do in the real world, but for this tutorial app, it's fine. Um, and then we create our calculator component, and you know it's just it just contains a simple you know a wrapper div, and then within that uh, the display and the grid of buttons, and then you know the buttons get past uh, a callback in the current operation. Okay, so we have the basic idea of our calculator here. You know, I mean this is what the component looks like. Uh, you know, the buttons and the display are similar kinds of things. Let's take a quick look at the uh, logic module. So this is where our button handlers live and basically in here we're importing a constant which is just a list of button names and uh, then we're importing a couple of types. And so we're just exporting from here uh, our handlers and that's just an object that is uh, basically binding the name of the button to its handler. And so the handlers are all just functions that take uh, a button args object, and that we saw in the, the calculator component. Uh, the button args are this thing, which is just all of these state variables and their, uh, their updaters. So each of these handlers takes a button args and it just pulls out the properties that it cares about uh, with destructuring here and then does whatever it needs to do to update the calculator state. So all clear will set the displayed value to zero and it will you know clear out any pending operation plus minus divide. Just nix that. Uh, dot will uh, look at the value and if it has a decimal in it uh, it will do nothing. If it doesn't have a decimal in it, dot will add a decimal to the end of the number. And, you know, the rest of our, of our button functions are in here. So this is what 
kind of what we're working with here and what we're going to test. And so in, in our case, we're just assuming, you know, we have an application. You know, nobody wrote test while it was being made, but now we're going to write some tests to, you know, prevent regressions. All right, so before we can write test, we've got to get intern in here and kind of make sure that that's working. And so to get intern, we're just going to npm install it. Whoops, save dev. While that's installing, let's go ahead and edit our intern config file. The intern config file is uh, just a JSON file. This, you know, it contains intern configuration options, and we need one of these in our project to tell intern when we run it that, hey, this is an intern project. Uh, and we're going to set it up right now to point to where we eventually plan to put some unit test suites. So we'll say test unit uh, any TS file under there. Uh, note that uh, we can use globs here for the suites list and also that we can put TS files directly in here because when we are running our tests in Node, uh, intern can take TypeScript directly. You don't have to pre-compile it. So this is our simple config file. We just finished installing intern up here. So let's actually check that it worked. So let's run npx intern. Uh, when you install intern, you get an intern, you know, binary script in your node modules bin directory. So we can just npx intern, excuse me, and uh, it ran. And so this is the expected output in this case because we have no test yet. So it ran, tested zero platforms, nothing passed, nothing failed. So we have intern. Uh, the next thing to look at is intern's interfaces. Intern provides three of them. Uh, they're all functionally equivalent. They just are different styles that you can use when writing your tests. So the first one is the TDD style. Uh, this one is just very straightforward. Uh, you create a suite with a suite function. You create a test with a test function. And you make assertions in general with the assert syntax, you know, assertion. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically the TDD interface. Uh, and you can see at the bottom of the TDD section here that this const suite test equals intern dot get plugin business, that is how you load an interface in a test. Um, you, you know, the, the interfaces exist as plugins in intern, and so you're just requesting uh, this plugin's exports from intern. So that's how you get that, and the same thing with assertions. In this case, we're getting them from Chai. Um, yeah. So the BDD interface is uh, another one. It's you know behavior-driven development is what BDD is. TDD is test-driven development. Um, so the BDD interface is exactly the same as the TDD interface. It just uses describe and it instead of suite and test. And the idea there is just more. It, it encourages sort of an English, for, you know, like a language flow when you talk about the suites and tests. So you're describing, you know, a resource, a module, a suite, and it should do something and it should do something else and, you know, that sort of thing. And it is common with BDD to use the expect syntax for your assertions. Uh, Chai supports both of these. It provides an assert um, and a, a set of assert functions basically and it also provides a set of expect functions um, and these again are, are functionally equivalent it's just one is you know they're different styles so with BDD it's normal to use expect you don't have to you can you can use assert with BDD and expect with TDD it's pretty flexible and then the third interface is the object interface. Uh, this one is, is kind of an intern unique one uh, where you don't use describe and add or suite and test. Instead, uh, rather than using functions to make your suites and tests, you, you create your entire suite in an object. It's a very declarative interface. So you make your suite in an object, and when you've constructed this object, you pass it to this register suite function and then that goes ahead and takes care of processing that into runnable suites and tests. And with object, um, again, the assertion syntax is pretty flexible. Usually I've seen people use assert with it. You could, again, totally use expect with it. 
Um, all three of the tests and taxes uh, support sweet lifecycle functions. So with all of them, you can use uh, before, before each, after, and after each. So before each and after each run before and after every test in a suite. Before and after run once at the, you know, before runs at the beginning of the suite before any test have run. And after runs at the end of the suite after all tests have run. So these are functions you can use to do setup and cleanup for individual tests or entire suites. All three, um, all three test interfaces also support async functionality. You just return a promise from a test and you're async. You can also declare tests to be async if you want to use async await uh, for any of these. So let's go on and actually write a unit test. So when we're going to write a unit test, <clears throat> Uh, the first thing we need to do is create a TypeScript config file, or well, the first thing we're going to do is uh, create a TypeScript config file in the test directory because the tests are going to need, actually first we're going to make a test directory. <laughs> then we're going to write a TS config file in there because the tests are going to use a slightly different set, they're going to use slightly different options than the TS config file that the rest of the app uses. Um, we're going to inherit from the base one because most of the options will be the same. Oops, spelled that wrong. All right, so the options that we're going to change uh, are we're going to set our module type to common JS, and we are going to disable this isolated module setting that. Uh, that the React TS config uses. And we're going to load the intern types because intern declares one global that uh, we want to have available so that we can do things like intern.get plugin. Uh, types intern. All right. Uh, the isolated modules, basically, we're disabling that so that we can write suites that aren't technically modules. I mean, we might want to write a suite that doesn't import or export anything. It's completely fine. Uh, but if we don't disable that setting, TypeScript will be sad about it. All right, and then we need to include our test files uh, in, you know, with this TS config. So we're just going to say anything under the test directory is handled by this TS config file. Oops, I spelled config wrong too. There we go. All right, so we got our TS config file. Let's update our intern.json file. We need to get that ready too. Uh, we're going to add the TS config that we just created to this node section. And so what we're doing here is, you know, I said earlier intern can process TypeScript by default, and it can and it uses the project default TS config uh, by default. And so, uh, but that's not the one we want to use. We want to use our tests one. So we're going to say node TS config test TS config.json. Uh, TS config goes in this little node block to make it very explicit that it only applies to a node environment. Uh, intern, like I said, can run in browsers and it can run in Node. Uh, you use the same config file for both. I mean, you don't have to, but it's pretty common to. And so within this config file, uh, you need to tell, you know, intern needs to know which things apply to browsers and which things apply to Node. And uh, in this case, we just wanted to make it very clear that TS config is really only a Node thing. Browsers, there's no TypeScript processing functionality for browsers. All right, so we got that. We've updated our config file. Um, now we should actually write the test. So let's see, we need to make the unit directory in test because we said we were going to put our tests in test unit. Uh, intern's pretty flexible about this. You don't have to put your test in a test directory or in test unit. You could put them in your application directory and call them, you know, .spec files if you wanted or something. Um, 
I normally just put them in a test directory because it seems cleaner to keep your test resources separate from your app. But it's very, uh, you know, it's very flexible about how you actually do that. All right, so let's edit test unit. Uh, we're going to test the logic uh, module. So vi test unit logic. So let's go ahead and import our interfaces. We're going to use the TDD interface. So sweet and test uh, equals intern dot get plugin interface TDD. And then we're going to import the assert. Uh, the assert interface from Chai. Okay, so we have these. So now we're going to make a suite. And we're going to call it logic. And we're going to write a test for the AC button handler. So let's go ahead and call our test AC. All right. Well, the first thing that we notice is that we're going to have to import the AC button handler to be able to test it. So let's import the button handlers from source logic. Okay, so we have that. Um, so button handlers.ac. Just try to call that. Oh, yeah, AC takes an argument. We saw earlier that it needs something of type button handler args. Whoops. So let's just go ahead and import that interface to button handler args from. That's one of the things that's in that common module. All right, so let's make an args that's of type button handler args. And so button handler args takes a value, it takes set value, and we'll just do this. And then it also takes uh, a total, which can be null or a number, and then we'll just have set total. And then it takes an operation, which can be an operation, which is a string, or null. And then we'll have set operation. And it takes an operation, which we should also import from up here. So all we've done here is made basically a, a mock of our button handler args. Uh, and we are just, you know, they, they have the value of the total in the operation state variables. We have the setters, and they're just going to update those variables in the state. So this will make it very easy for us to pass in something that, uh, you know, that's under our control, and then look at how it changed after we've called the function. So we're going to pass this in, and now TypeScript is happy about it. Okay, so now we can call our function and we're passing it something and we're, you know, we actually want to run a test. So what is AC supposed to do? If we go look at it, it's supposed to clear the value and clear the operation. So let's check that that happens. So first, we're going to set the value to something and we're going to set the operation to something we're going to call this function, and then we're going to look and see if they actually got uh, got cleared. So we're going to assert that um, that our value is zero, and we are going to assert that our operation uh, is null. And so if you notice, when I, you know, as it quickly popped up, when I typed assert and hit period, there's, there are many, many assertions that you can make uh, using chai. And again, uh, the, the main value of all these, I mean, these are things you can do yourself with just code and if statements. The value you get from using these assertions in chai is that um, it's more compact and easier to read, and also chai will construct friendly uh, or at least useful exception messages for you. 
So we'll look at that in a second. So we made this test. All right, we've made our assertions. We called our function. So let's actually go down here and run it. So we'll just run in turn. We've already pointed it at our test, so it should run our test, and it did. In the node environment, we ran uh, the logic suite, the AC test. Uh, one test passed. If we wanted to see what happens if it fails, let's jump over to this AC code real quick and you know make it do something wrong. So let's say it sets the value to negative one. Okay. So if we run our test now, it's going to run and it's going to fail and the failure we get is, oh, there's an assertion error. We expected negative one to equal zero. So this is Chai constructing a nice sort of useful error message for us. Uh, we can make that even more potentially contextual if we want. We can add a message here at the end. Um, so maybe uh, incorrect, you know, or we could say expected AC to clear value. So now if you run the test, I mean it's still going to fail, but now we get an even more contextual message here. Expected, you know, expect AC to clear value, we expected negative one to equal zero. So Chai lets you make, you know, meaningful, meaningful assertion messages. So let's just fix that and make sure that our test passes again. And so this is our first unit test, and it's running in Node, and there you go. Okay, so we ran it in Node, but one of our big things is being able to run tests in the browser. Um, there's a problem, though, which is that we can't run TypeScript directly in the browser. So what are we going to do for that? We've got a couple of different options. Uh, when you're using a React app or something that's normally built with Webpack, Webpack is probably the most straightforward way to go about that. The goal there is just to bundle up your TypeScript and everything it needs for its test into a JavaScript bundle that we can load into the browser. So to do that, uh, we're going to make a minimal Webpack config and we're going to make a couple other little updates to our project and then we're going to build that and run that. So first, let's, uh, we're going to need the TS loader since we're going to be webpacking TypeScript code. Uh, we need that. We're also going to need the webpack CLI. We've already got webpack from React scripts um, and you know normally you shouldn't normally rely too much on you know transitory or transient package dependencies like we're doing like we're going to do, but it's just a little simpler in this case. So we're just going to install the CLI, and it will work with the Webpack that we already have. So let's install the Webpack CLI and then TS Loader, and while those are going, we're going to uh, edit our web. We're going to create actually a Webpack config. And in our webpack config, uh, we're going to import resolve because we're going to have to resolve a couple of paths. We are going to export our config. Whoops. All right, so mode development because webpack needs that now for our entry. Uh, for our test, in general, it's going to be most efficient to just build all of your unit tests that you plan to run into a single package. Um, there are other ways you could do this. You could build them into separate packages and use, you know, like vendor chunking or some such. Uh, for our case, we only have one test. But if you do have, even, you know, even a moderate number of tests, it's entirely possible to just build them into one bundle so that they'll run. So we're going to run test unit logic.ts. So this is going to be our entry point for our, you know what we're going to do with it is we are going to compile it to a file name called unit.js because we're assuming this is just all of our unit tests. The path is going to be uh, we're going to put it in tests in the root in the project root directory. Okay. 
we have to set up uh, what we need to handle TypeScript. So for this, we're going to say, all right, uh, if we have a TS file or a TSX file, uh, we're going to use the TS loader. We're going to pass it a couple of options. We're going to tell it, most importantly, that uh, it needs to use this config file that is our test TS config file. Rename tsconfig.json. We also want to change another compiler option, specifically just for Webpack, and that one is no emit the React config, which our test config is inheriting from, uh, enabled this no emit option. For our own purposes, we don't want that, so we're going to turn that off here, and this will just allow this simple Webpack config to build our stuff. Uh, so we close this, we close this, we close rules, and then we just have to tell Webpack that you can resolve TypeScript modules or TypeScript files. ts.tsx.js.jsx. So none of this is really so much intern specific as it is it's Webpack. Um, but yeah, this is this is sort of the minimal minimal webpack config for our simple React example here. All right, so we got this. Uh, wait, we don't want that semicolon. So now we have a webpack config. Um, we installed TS Loader. We installed Webpack CLI. Let's make sure that our webpack build works. Uh, no, npx webpack. Um, config tests webpack.config.js. So if we set things up right, this will run and it will give us something in that test directory. And it did. So now we can build our unit tests. Okay, now we need to tell intern that it should run our tests in a browser. So we're going to edit our intern config again. And in our intern config, we're going to add a new browser section. And in this browser section, we are going to tell it which suites we want to run in the browser. And they will be tests unit.js. Then we're going to move this suites declaration into the node object. So the deal with that is when suites is up here, it applies to both the node and browser environment. So when you're running in node, uh, you will get whatever suites are here and any suites in this node block. If you're running in a browser, you get whatever the base suites are plus any other suites in browser. We're just going to stick this in node. This means that uh, we are only going to run these suites in node, which is fine because node's the only one that can process the TypeScript, and we're only going to run these suites in the browser. So now we've told intern what we want to run in the browser. Now we need to tell it what browsers we want to run these things in. For that, we use an environments property. The environments property just tells intern what environments we want to run our tests in. By default, there's one environment and it's Node. We're going to keep doing that and we're also going to add another environment, Chrome. Okay, so we have two environments. Let's go ahead and run our test, uh, npx intern. So now what we should see happen is we're, we're seeing this listening on localhost. That's intern starting a test server uh, for the browser to load the test from. And then we see it starting a browser, and we see all this stuff happening. Uh, this stuff that is happening is intern running feature tests in the browser to try to see if there are any uh, any uh, bits of functionality in the browser that are maybe operating in a non-standard way or that are broken or something uh, because different browsers don't always work exactly the same way. Uh, intern tries to look for some of those differences and deal with them behind the scenes so that you don't have to make a lot of fiddly adjustments to your tests. 
That can be a little bit annoying sometimes though, so if you want, uh, if you're sure that you're using a modern browser that's probably implementing, you know, current JS specs pretty closely, you can disable those feature tests. Uh, and for that, we can just use a slightly more, uh, you know, long, longer syntax for specif specifying our environment. And we can say browser Chrome uh, fix session capabilities. We can set it to true, false, or no detect. Either one of these will, you know, for our purposes should be fine. We'll just set it to false. Uh, no detect basically sets some, uh, some internal properties. If it happens to know something about a browser that might be broken, like, you know, IE10 doesn't support this feature, intern maybe doesn't even need to test for that. It just, it's like, oh, this is IE10. We know this is broken. That's what no detect does. But in general, Chrome should be fine. So we're just going to disable that, and the whole purpose of disabling this right here is just it makes uh, our test run a bit faster in the browser. So now if we run our tests, we will see them run in Node here very quickly, and we'll see our browser pop up. It will run the tests, um, and it was much quicker that time. There was none of the, you know, the feature test running beforehand. All right, so... This is pretty cool now. We're running our tests in Node. We're running our tests in the browser. <laughs> Intern tries to make it easy to run your tests kind of everywhere. Uh, so in addition to you know what we're doing now, we could add other browsers. So say we could run Firefox. OK. So now if we run our test, we will see the node test happen, we will see Firefox pop up, and our test will run in Firefox. So that's pretty sweet. So we can run in different browsers. Uh, we can also run on cloud services. So if we wanted to, in this case, we could say, all right, um, we're going to use this tunnel variable to use a different, uh, basically a different target. So what the tunnel is, tunnels are a thing provided by an intern support library called DigDug, and tunnels are what intern uses to talk to remote browsers. So by default, we're using the Selenium tunnel that uses a local copy of Selenium to talk to Chrome and Firefox and you know the browsers you have installed locally. We can also hook up to cloud testing services, um, and we can use a null tunnel which basically tells intern don't don't do anything you know I've I'm running a web driver server or selenium sort of externally on my own just talk to it don't try to start your own but let's try uh, let's try using browser stack just to kind of show that you don't really you know it's pretty easy to do that so we're changing you know sort of one line of config here and we're saying we want to use browser stack um, we're also going to set up some capabilities here that are browser stack specific just to make it a little easier to see them. I was going to show them in the, the browser stack dashboard. Uh, you don't have to do this, but we can. Um, whoops. I can look up exactly what those are again. Uh, let's set our build name to, um, whoops. Set our build name to OJSW and let's set our project name to intern tutorial. And again, these are browser stack specific properties that we're setting. Um, this capabilities property are like uh, these are settings that get passed to whatever uh, browser or remote session that we are starting. So that's just what goes in capabilities. It's kind of a random metadata grab bag. Um, so here we're saying we're going to run tests on browser stack. And this, again, entirely optional. It just makes it a little easier for us to see what, uh, what's going on with browser stack. Another thing to keep in mind is when you use any of these cloud services, you do need to have an account. 
So you'll need your own credentials to do that. This little R test thing that I'm throwing in the beginning here um, is just a script that I have that loads up some of my credentials into environment variables. So we're going to go ahead and run this. And we will see it, you know, it's tunnel downloading. It's downloading the browser stack tunnel executable. It runs a node test. And then startup is a little bit slower here than it was for the local test. Um, but you can see that popped up very quickly, you know, actually relatively quickly. And so it was a remote session Chrome 83 on Windows. If we go over here and we refresh the dashboard that I have open, we don't see any builds. Why don't we see any builds? Um, let's just, oh, there we go. Okay, so this is our, our test run that's running right now. And we can see we had Chrome and it ran and we had Firefox and it's still running. And so with browser stack, just as an example, and the other services work similarly, you can give a browser name and it just picks the most recent version and usually on Windows. You can also specify browser versions or ranges of versions if you want to run on multiple versions. And you can also specify the, the OS that you want to run tests on. So you can do all of that just you know within this intern config. So this is us running tests on browser stack. So that is pretty sweet that we can do that. Except for our Firefox test, which finished but our session didn't quite end. Oh, there it goes. Okay, Firefox, a little slow to finish there. Anyway, so uh, so as I said, you know, all of this this tunnel system is provided by uh, by DigDug. That's the name of the intern package that uh, that handles that, and it has again several tunnels. So there are a couple more tests we can do uh, as well. Actually, I mean, they're a functional test. We haven't done any of those yet. So uh, for functional tests, you know, I mentioned those before. The big deal about those is they involve browsers, but they don't run in browsers. And so this is just uh, sort of an overview of what our functional testing API looks like. Uh, you can see here that we're, we're getting this remote object passed into the tests. Um, all tests in intern are past something. They're, they're past a, a test with a capital T object, well, an, an instance of test. Uh, but usually you don't need anything on that, so we don't, you know, it's not usually shown. In this case, though, we do need this remote property from the test. And so the remote is what's going to give us access to our functional testing API. Uh, the functional testing API is provided by an intern package called Leadfoot. Uh, it's called that because when it was originally created, it was a lot faster than any other web driver API. It's not, not much of a difference now, but it's still called Leadfoot. But uh, so Leadfoot's API is an asynchronous, fluent, you know, a chained API. So basically from, from remote, you will call something like get to load a web page. Once you have a page, you might call like find by CSS selector or find by you know name. There's, there's a variety of find functions to locate elements. That's a thing you might want to do. Uh, once you have an element, you can interact with it with like you know clicking. Um, and then uh, you might also, I mean, you can get information from elements. Uh, like in this example, we're getting visible text. Uh, you'll also notice that there's this end thing sitting in the middle of the command chain. What that is, is because, excuse me, um, so in our command chain, you need to find elements and interact with them, right? But all of these commands are in a single chain. So how do you decide what you were interacting with? In turn, uh, in a single chain, maintains a context element, and the context element is kind of the the basis for what any following commands are, are going to you know work from. So, uh, if you want to interact with an element, you you find it, and then it becomes the context element, and then you you know any actions you take that are element specific, like clicking or getting text or something, 
uh, those are done on the context element. Uh, the context, so intern can, can manage multiple context elements and they're stored in a stack. And so, uh, you know, when you, when you do something, it's on the context element. Uh, if you want to sort of back up and work on a previous context element or just get rid of the whole context and just do something with reference to the entire page, you call end and end just pops something off the stack. So that's kind of what's going on there is so we find an element, we do something with it, we call end to wipe that back off the stack and then we find a new element and we do something with it. Uh, and then we can make assertions. We don't need to have an end at the end of the command chain because that whole context business is specific to a single command chain. Uh, so, you know, once, once we return this thing, we're done with that. Um, another thing to really keep in mind is that the command API is asynchronous. So the end of that command chain, I mean, it's, it's a promise chain basically, or a promise like chain. So for intern to wait for that to finish, you need to make sure to return that chain. So uh, yeah, that's that's the thing that, that I've seen and done myself, forgotten to do. Because uh, then your test starts to look great. It's like, oh, it passed. And then you'll see weird errors popping up later on in the testing process because those promises started failing or something. And it's, it's not good. So you always want to return a command chain. But that whole thing can become a little bit easier if you use async await. So here's the same set of commands uh, using the functional test API, but just using async await instead of the fluent command chaining stuff. Uh, and for this, you can see we, we call a get uh, to get a page and we just await it. And like when we look for an element, we, you know, the find by CSS selector method returns that element and it always does. Here we're just awaiting it so, you know, when that asynchronous call resolves, we get the element out of it. Uh, then we can call a method directly on the element. So here we can, you know, get the button and then call click on the button. We don't have to deal with the context stack or popping things off of it or whatever. So it's a little more verbose because we have awaits everywhere. Uh, but it is, I think, a good deal cleaner to see, you know, to, to deal to see what's going on. It's it's a little more straightforward to work with. So this is just another way of using the functional API that can potentially be cleaner, but you know, either way does work. Okay, so let's write a functional test. So to write a functional test, we are gonna make a directory in test called functional. And we're going to write a functional test just for our whole app. Uh, so we're going to call test functional app.ts and we're going to do the whole um, the whole importing of our suite and test bit again. Suite test from, no, not from. I'm going to remember that one of these days. Get plugin interface.tdd um, assert equals Plug in chai. All right. And then we say sweet app. And we say test. Uh, we're going to test adding two numbers. That's going to be our first test. So that'll involve some button clicking and, uh, and looking at the output. Add two numbers. OK. So we get our remote object. Okay, so in our test, the thing we're going to need to do is, well, the first thing we're going to want to do is load our test page. Oh, yeah, we're going to call this async so we can use async await. And we're going to say remote.get our test page. Then we're going to want to get some buttons and click them. So if we're going to add two numbers, let's, let's add one plus two and make sure that they equal three. So let's say one equals remote dot find by CSS selector buttons one. So for this app, if we just go over and inspect it, if I can see where my inspector is here, um, we can just go look at our buttons and they all have, you know, their class names are button dash the name of the button. 
Okay, so we got the one button. Let's go ahead and await one dot click. All right. And just because this will run really fast when we run it, let's go ahead and throw in a sleep in here just for, for us humans so that we can see what uh, what's going on when we're clicking these buttons. If we don't, I mean, we don't, you, you wouldn't normally put this sleep in here, and generally sleeps and tests are not a thing you should do. Um, but in this case, like I said, it's just just for the humans to be able to see this happening, because otherwise it just goes by very fast. All right, so, uh, oh, and in between clicking one and two, we need to, uh, we need to click plus. Okay. So we click one, we click plus, we click two. Now we need to click equals. Okay, and now we need to read the display and see if it has the value we expect. And the display is just called, it uses the class display. Um, value equals wait display dot get text whoops get visible text all right and now we're going to assert equal value and one plus two should hopefully equal three all right so we have a functional test now our functional test gets a page uh, it clicks some buttons and then it reads the value from the display. And again, this is, you know, all sort of from a human centric perspective, the way the things we have available to do are in general, what a person looking at this web app would be able to do. We also need to make, I think one more change to our intern JSON file. Um, well, we need to make two changes. One, we need to tell this thing that we have some functional suites. So those are functional. Even though functional suites only apply to node, we don't actually put them in the node object. That's just kind of historical inconsistency at the moment. Um, but yeah, functional suites only apply to node. If you load this config in a browser, the browser, the, the intern in the browser is smart enough to know that it can't run functional tests so it just ignores this. We also want to specify a functional timeouts. Uh, this is necessary because it didn't used to be necessary but it has become necessary and I just haven't put a default in intern yet. Um, but the idea is when you do these functional commands like gets and finds and such, um, there are timeouts so that if you know you make one of these calls and it takes too long, there's a timeout. This is managed not by intern but externally by Selenium or WebDriver. And so uh, they used to have reasonable defaults in, for most browsers, now they're zero. And so with a zero timeout, most of your things will start to time out pretty quickly, so it's good to set some defaults for these functional timeouts. But again, future version of intern will do that, this particular thing automatically. All right, so we have functional suites, we have functional timeouts, um, we have our tests. Let's see if it actually works. Oh yeah, let's also uh, disable this browser stack bit. Another interesting thing is interns config file is JSON, but it's sort of an extended JSON that supports comments. So you can comment things out in an intern config. Let's also comment out one of our browsers here, again, just to make this a little bit faster. So if we run our tests now, we're gonna see our unit test run in Node. We're gonna see Firefox pop up. We'll see our unit test result happen, and then we're seeing our buttons being clicked right now for our functional test. And so even with the one second waits, that was a little snappy. So if we open it up again, just to kind of catch it again, we see browser, now we see it click one, click plus, click two, 
click equals, and we're done. And so we see this test pass. So that is a pretty simple functional test. And just like our unit test, we can run our functional test on browser stack or on Sauce Labs or whatever on different combinations of browsers and operating system. So we can basically ensure that our application is behaving the way that we want uh, in all the combinations of things that we need it to run in. In addition to you know basic functional tests, Intern has a couple of you know pre-built plugins to run other kinds of you know functional tests, uh, async, ex excuse me, uh, accessibility and visual regression tests. And I mean these are pretty simple implementations of these tests, um, but they are enough to handle simple cases and they again kind of work out of the box there. So just to give you a quick taste for what those look like, uh, let's go ahead and install the packages we would need for those. Let's grab the intern Y and the intern visual plugin. So again, the accessibility one is looking for accessibility checks. So like, um, you know, missing alt tags and an image element, for example, or things like that. Um, it uses, you know, there are a couple of different um, external tools Intern uses to do that. One is Axe, which is a local library. One is Tenon, which is a cloud service that you need an account on. The other, you know, our visual plugin test here does simple visual regression testing. And so it will um, basically take a snapshot of your page and then later when you run test, it will compare a rendering of your page against that snapshot. And uh, if it differs, it will tell you. So our you know quick and dirty test for these will look pretty much like what's on the slide there. Uh, let's just call this one A11Y check, uh, remote. Wait, hacks.check. We need to pass it the remote and we need to give it the source URL that we want to test, which is the same thing we're using for our functional test up there HTTP localhost 3000. We do need to import that X deal so that we have it. Actually, I think the, the, uh, I think the import is called services from the intern A11Y. And then this is uh, services.ax. Okay, so this is an accessibility test. And let's go ahead and throw in our visual regression test too. Uh, and in this one, this one's a little interesting because we have a helper uh, function that actually just writes the whole test for us, you know, that creates the test function for us. So from this plugin, we are going to grab visual test, uh, visual plugin. Okay, and so here we're just going to call this visual test. And it takes a URL, which again, same as this one. And it takes this missing baseline property, which is telling it what to do, sort of in the initial case, if there's no baseline. Should it, you know, whine about that, or should it just take a new snapshot? So we're telling it take a new snapshot. Oh, we got the parentheses there. Okay, so now we've added uh, A11Y or accessibility and visual regression tests. And again, these are just very basic test using these these two uh, already existing plugins that exist for intern. So if we run these tests, let's just go ahead and do that. Both of them, uh, actually the accessibility test will fail. The uh, visual test should pass by default. The accessibility test is going to fail for the same reason that React has been whining about us this whole time. Um, this missing alt text. So if we go look up here, we see 
that our accessibility test failed, a violation was logged, um, but our visual test down here was fine. So let's go take a quick look at our at what happened there. So we have this uh, accessibility report. So if we go look in this accessibility report, we see that there is an HTML file. This is our report. If we open this, um, uh, oh, what did I do? Oh, there we go. Sorry, it was Firefox. If we uh, if we open our report here, we see that it's telling us what was wrong. That uh, the app logo image doesn't have alt text. So if we go into our app where we have our image, sure enough, there's no alt text. And again, ESLint uh, was whining about this the entire time too. So probably would have caught that with our current tooling, but you can certainly imagine situations where you wouldn't. So if we just add an intern logo alt tag, tag there and we run our test again, we will see that our accessibility check passes. All right. So that passed. Uh, as far as the visual test goes, that's testing visual code. So, um, you know, we haven't seen any violations with that yet. If we go and do, if we change some visual aspect of our application, for example, let's go change the size of our little intern logo down there. And let's do that in, uh, actually, let's just remove it. Okay, so now the logo is gone. So now let's run our tests and see what happens. Okay, so we can see it doing the functional test. The A11Y test was fine, but now our visual regression test failed. Okay, so we have, you know, we can see up here, error, failed visual regression. We have this visual test directory that gets generated by the, uh, the visual regression plugin here, and it has a report. So we can open that report. Uh, not the A11Y report, the visual test report. And if we open that, we see down here this red vertical, you know, line business. That is what it looks like when the visual regression test is highlighting the problem. And so the problem is. Uh, right here, and in this case, it's th that thing is gone. So, again, it's a it's a simple visual regression test. It's not you know you you won't be able to use it for super complex situations, but again, it is sort of an example of what you can do with intern just with writing fairly you know straightforward, easy to use plugins. So hopefully, um, this has given you. A reasonable overview, and I know it wasn't it wasn't in great depth, but hopefully you've gotten sort of a sense of what you can do with Intern, and at least how to get started with it, and how to approach using Intern. And so here we have a number of resources. Uh, we have links to various places where Intern information is. The Intern.io is the main website with uh, links to all of the sub projects and it has all of the you know project and API documentation. Uh, we have the intern is the main repo, the intern visual plugin and A11Y are in their own repos there. Uh, Chai JS's API is what we use for assertions. And uh, you know we mentioned browser stack and so all of the web services have their own versions of this, but this is where browser stack describes the different capabilities you can use, like we passed in that, that project name and uh, build name. There are a variety of other properties you can send into browser stack and they're described there. If you have questions or you need help, there are a couple of good resources. Uh, there's the Gitter channel for the intern. Uh, I am always on there, so you can always ask questions there. 
And you can also always ask questions on Stack Overflow using the tag intern. So hopefully this has been an informative workshop. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you.